Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. On an end-to-end -end basis in LTE, a large number of different identities are actually utilised. And those are identities associated with the user equipment and indeed the subscriber, but also identities found in the radio access network and indeed the core network. So in this session, we're just going to explore those different identities that are encountered. Starting off with the mobile device itself, or more specifically, in the case of the subscriber, their IMSI. So just like in 2G and 3G networks, in LTE, the IMSI is used as the subscriber reference. So when you see the subscriber being identified in the core network in certain elements of signaling, it's the IMSI that's actually used. So a good example would be on the S6A interface between the MME and the HSS. It would be the IMSI that's used on that interface to identify the subscriber. On occasion, the network will not know the IMSI of the device trying to access the network. So there will be times when you actually see the IMSI being supplied to the network by the mobile. Now just like the IMSI, we also have the IMEI-SV, which is also used in 2G and 3G. So the IMEI-SV is how we identify the mobile equipment on a unique basis, but the SV element stands for software version. So we're also finding out what version of perhaps iOS or Android that the device is running. Now, in 2G and 3G, we have temporary identifiers. Temporary identifiers like the Timsy or the Packet Timsy. It's exactly the same in LTE. We do not want to constantly use the IMSI across the air interface because sometimes our air interface is not encrypted. So instead of using the IMSI, we use a temporary ID termed the globally unique temporary identity. And this is an identity which is set by the MME when you attach to the network. Now the GUTI, as you can see, is a relatively long identity. It's between 61 and 62 bits. So in order to reduce just the level of ones and noughts that we're sending across the air interface and such like, we can actually use a shorter version of the GUTI. And it's called the STIMSY. So this is a shorter version. So once we've attached to the network and we've been given our GUTI, particularly in the RAN, you actually use the STIMSY rather than the GUTI just to shorten the number of ones and zeros that we're actually sending in order to identify this subscriber. The STIMSY is actually derived from the GUTI. And we'll see momentarily the composition of the GUTI and indeed the STIMSY. The device will eventually receive an IP address. So when we connect to a given packet data network, the PDN gateway will provide an IP address relative to that packet data network, allowing the device to function as a device on that particular network. Now, what that means is if I connect to different PDNs simultaneously, the device may actually have different IP addresses. They could be V4 or they could be V6 addresses. So we could have multiple IP addresses used on the device relative to each individual packet data network that we connect to. Remember that devices in our LTE network, whether it's the eNode B or the serving gateway or whatever, they do not need to know this particular IP address. Because remember, things like the eNode B and the serving gateway are simply elements of a tunnel called our EPS bearer. So this IP packet, which is identified with this particular IP address, will simply be tunneled through those devices. So we could have multiple IP addresses on a more local basis between the device and the actual cell that we're connected to, the eNode B that we're connected to. You will also have a cell radio network temporary identity. So this is administered by the eNode B. So a variety of different identities that the 
user equipment is, is identified through or indeed the subscriber. Now, as mentioned, the next thing we're going to do is look at the breakdown of the GUTI. So the GUTI is the globally unique temporary ID and it is comprised of a globally unique MME ID and an MTIMSI. The globally unique MME ID is as the title suggests. It is the identity of the MME that has created this GUTI. The MTIMSI is the random string of ones and zeros at the end. So it's the MME that creates the MTIMSI. Now we can break this down a little bit further. The globally unique MME ID is actually comprised of a mobile country code, mobile network code and MME ID. So by that rationale, every MME in the world has a unique identity. We can go even further. The actual MME identity can be broken down into an MME group ID and an MME code. And the reason we have this breakdown is to facilitate MME pooling. Another point to add, there will be times, this is not uncommon, there will be times when a packet TIMSI from GPRS is actually used to formulate a GUTI. And the reason this is often the case is when the device has been on 3G, for instance, it already has a packet TIMSI and it enters 4G. It can take that packet TIMSI and turn it into a GUTI to use when it communicates with the LTE network. And to do that, a mapping process must take place. So in order to map EUTRAN to GIRAN UTRAN, we've got the packet TIMSI, which is mapped to the MTIMSI, and we use the location area code and routing area code to map to the group ID and the code of the MME. So by using that mapping process, we can use that packet TIMSI when we enter the LTE network, when we come from uh, GPRS. So that is the composition of the GUTI. Lots of acronyms there. We've also got the STIMSI. Now remember that the STIMSI is the shorter version of the GUTI, used routinely in, for instance, paging. So the STIMSI, you can see the breakdown, is the MME code and the MTIMSI. So Moving on now, away from the composition of the GUTI, we're going to start moving into the network and now look at EUTRAN identities. And the first identity we come across is the global E node B ID. So every E node B in our radio access network has a unique identity. You can see it's made up of the mobile country code, mobile network code, and E node B ID. Now, every cell within our radio access network is also uniquely identified. So we've got an EUTRAN cell global identity. And again, you can see the breakdown, mobile country code, mobile network code, and EUTRAN cell ID. And likewise, all of our tracking areas, so remember multiple cells will form a tracking area, and all of our tracking areas also have a unique ID in our RAN. So the tracking area composition, mobile country code, mobile network code, and tracking area code. And it's the tracking area ID that's used in the formulation of tracking area list. So that's our EUTRAN, and now we move on to our Revolve Packet Core. And we've already discussed the globally unique MME ID. Remember, this is a unique identity for the MME, so every MME around the world will have a unique ID. But we also have IP addressing for all of our network nodes, E node B's included. So our serving gateway, MME, PDN gateway, they all have IP addresses. But remember, these are not in relation to the packet data network, how we discussed with the user equipment. These IP addresses are simply associated with the underlying transport network. So if an MME wants to get a message to the HSS or wants to get a message to the serving gateway, it uses an IP connection. It sends that message as a payload of an IP datagram. So each and every device will have an IPv4 or an IPv6 IP address. We will also have a fully qualified domain name for our devices. And we've got an example up on screen there where we're identifying 
Well, in this case, it would be an E node B, which is not strictly a Volve Packet Core, but our Evolve Packet Core devices would also have fully qualified domain names. And the reason we have this is for a variety of different reasons. It could be associated with diameter routing or indeed associated with load balancing on DNS. Finally, we've got our access point name. Our PDNs that we are able to connect to are actually identified by an APN and the composition of that APN is a network ID plus operator ID. So when we connect to a particular PDN, the device needs to identify the access point name to which we are connecting. So just in summary there, we saw a variety of different identities used in LTE. For instance, from the perspective of the mobile user, whether it's the subscription or the terminal, we saw the IMSI, IME, ISV. We also saw things like the GUTI and the STIMSI, IP addressing, and also the cell radio network temporary ID. From the perspective of the EUTRAN, we saw the global eNode BID. We also saw the cell ID and the tracking area ID. And from the core network perspective, we saw things like the globally unique MME ID, unique IP addresses, fully qualified domain names, and on a per PDN connection basis, we also saw the requirement for access point names. Need to know more? Why not visit our store where you can choose from over 200 hours of video-based training? Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.